Urinary tract infections or UTIs are something that we see a lot of in the office. And these guidelines are really helpful to reaffirm our knowledge in areas where we know what we're doing and to update in our, our knowledge in areas where there's some uncertainty. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and today we're going to talk about guidelines going over prevention, diagnosis, and management of urinary tract infections. This is from a new group that issues guidelines, the Wiki Guidelines Group. Ordinarily, I wouldn't have thought to cover a guideline from this group, but it was published in JAMA Network Open, a journal that I respect. And to be honest with you, looking carefully at these guidelines, they are really well done. They are evidence-based and they cover this topic really really well. So we're going to cover diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. Let's start with diagnosis. The first step is do not order a urinalysis or a urine culture on someone unless the person is having symptoms of UTI. Now, this may seem kind of obvious, but this is particularly important in older individuals where asymptomatic bacteria is very common and does not need to be treated. Non-specific symptoms, things like just not feeling well for a day, do not warrant our checking a urinalysis and culture, since there's no easy way to distinguish between asymptomatic bacteria and an actual UTI. The best and most important first step in making the diagnosis of the UTI accurately is to only order urine studies in people who have a reasonable chance of having a urine infection. The guidelines suggest then that the diagnosis of a UTI should be primarily based on clinical symptoms. This is so important. A urinalysis can provide further information, but the authors caution that we should not rely solely on the urinalysis. This is an incredibly important evidence-based recommendation, if you think about it. This, uh, this supports actually the common decision to treat UTIs over the phone without having to see a patient in the office to check uh, a urinalysis. The rationale for this recommendation is that a urinalysis is neither sensitive nor specific. For leukocyte esterase, the sensitivity is only about 80% and the specificity is way less. For a positive nitrate on UA, the sensitivity is below 50%, meaning the test would be negative more than half of the time when someone actually has a UTI. The specificity of urine nitrate, though, is high, over 90%. So if someone's nitrite positive, they likely have a UTI. What this all means is that a person's description of, a, uh, of classic urinary tract infection symptoms, urinary burning, frequency, urgency, is about as good, if not a better indicator, of them actually having UTI than a urinalysis. The guidelines go on to say that in simple, uncomplicated cystitis in healthy, non-pregnant individuals, routine cultures are not necessary. You know, there was a fascinating meta-analysis in JAMA a few years ago that showed that for women presenting to outpatient clinics with at least two symptoms of UTI and the absence of vaginal discharge, there was a greater than 90% likelihood of them having acute cystitis. A reminder here, though, if a woman is sexually active and at risk for STIs, then consider testing for an STI as well, as the symptoms of sexually transmitted diseases can mimic those of urinary tract infections. Let's go on now to talk about treatment. Treatment for UTI is usually empiric, with treatment initiated before culture returns. Cultures only need to be done for people with complicated infections, such as pyelonephritis, or for people with recurrent infections. Decisions about what to use for treatment can be influenced by local patterns of resistance and an individual's individual risk factors for antimicrobial, antimicrobial resistance. As a general rule, though, for uncomplicated cystitis, nitrofurantoin for five days is a reasonable first-line agent. 
there's good evidence of efficacy and less likelihood of antimicrobial resistance developing than when using antibiotics that might also be used for other systemic infections. Other reasonable first-line agents for uncomplicated cystitis include trimethoprim sulfa for three days, phosphomycin orally in a single dose, or a beta-lactam antibiotic, most commonly a first-generation cephalosporin. For first-generation cephalosporins, it, the guidelines did not give clear duration because there aren't good studies in clarifying duration of treatment. Also mentioned were two unfamiliar antibiotics, pevmicillinam, which is a recently FDA-approved beta-lactam agent for three days, and gepodiacin, which is from a new class of antibiotic that is currently under FDA review. Fluoroquinolones should not usually be first-line agents unless other treatment options are not appropriate. It's important, of course, to distinguish between uncomplicated cystitis and pyelonephritis. For pyelonephritis, that is upper tract infections, the first decision has to do with the location of care, and that's determined by how sick someone is and the likelihood that they might have gram-negative bacteremia all of which determine whether they need to be in the hospital for IV antibiotics or whether they can be treated as an outpatient. For outpatient treatment of pyelonephritis, the guidelines suggest that trimethoprim sulfa or a first-generation cephalosporin are both reasonable first-line uh, first agents, with fluoroquinolones also being a reasonable choice. Ceftriaxone is the recommended uh, antibiotic as first-line therapy for patients who do require intravenous therapy. Let's now talk about prevention of UTIs. And this is an area where, in my experience, people often forget that there's a lot we can do to prevent UTIs in people, particularly women, with recurrent UTIs. For this, there's both non-pharmacologic as well as pharmacologic approaches. Let's start with the non-pharmacologic approaches first. First increasing water intake. There have been one randomized controlled trial in women with recurrent cystitis who drank less than a liter and a half of fluid a day. That trial showed that the women randomized to an additional one and a half liters of water daily had significantly less recurrent cystitis, and that decrease was 50% less than the group randomized to continue their usual water intake. Because this was the only randomized trial to show this effect, it was graded as not a strong recommendation, because, but because there's so little downside in healthy women increasing water intake, it is certainly reasonable to recommend. Another commonly discussed intervention is the use of cranberry products. As it turns out here, most prospective studies have shown that cranberry products can, in fact, reduce the risk of symptomatic UTI in women with recurrent UTIs. Let's now move on to pharmacologic therapy. For postmenopausal women with recurrent UTIs, topical vaginal estrogen has a strong base of evidence, over 30 randomized trials, that it's effective in reducing recurrent UTIs with a reduction of 50 to 90% in the incidence of recurrent UTIs. Topical estrogen has minimal systemic absorption, and there are no concerning safety signals with regard to either thromboembolic disease, endometrial, or breast cancer. Next up, methanamine hypurate is also recommended and is an FDA-approved indication for prevention of UTIs. It works by releasing formaldehyde in urine that leads to bacteriostasis, which is how it in turn leads to a decrease in UTIs. Finally, antibiotics, postcoital or daily, administration of trimethoprim sulfa, nitrofurantoin, norfloxacin, and ciprofloxacin all have comparable efficacy for prophylaxis with a meta-analysis showing a decrease in recurrence rates of approximately 85%. The guideline states there's insufficient evidence to support the use of either probiotics or D-mannose to prevent UTIs. 
This is really a wonderful update on a common problem that we see often. We all have a lot of clinical experience in this area, so I'm interested in your thoughts. Please leave your thoughts in the comments section. I'm Dr. Neil Skolnick, and this is Medscape.